Hello. What? Sorry, I didn't hear that, so I can't make a snappy comeback. Um, I'll pop right in. In 1933, an intrepid British Royal Air Force pilot named Captain Cull spotted an undersea line lying underneath the waters a few kilometers off the coast of Egypt. Note that Egypt was at the time a British protectorate, quote unquote, uh, after World War I. So that's what he was doing flying around there at the time. The spot we are talking about is called Abukir Bay, about 30 kilometers east of Alexandria. A map. A map. <laughs> the line that he saw was probably not lime green, but this is an extremely public domain image. Uh, <laughs> what he saw appeared to be a series of structures, a temple wall, as it later turned out, which had long ago slipped down into the bay. Well, you sure don't see that every day, evidence of an underwater civilization. And this was in 1933, long, long before Eric von Däniken and Chariots of the Gods, and this guy, <laughs> and the Bermuda Triangle craze. Those things were way off in 1933. So Captain Cull had no reason to doubt that when he saw a structure under the water, he was looking at a bit of human civilization, not a UFO base. So he passed on his report right away when he got back down on the ground. And almost immediately afterward, nothing whatsoever happened for 60 years. <laughs> Why was there no follow through on this? Well, I mean, things were complicated at the time. I mean, Italy was invading e Ethiopia next door. There was the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty of 1936, which limited British power in Egypt. And there was also a lot of invasive archaeology happening in Egypt at the time in the form of Harrison Ford fighting Nazis <laughs> over the Ark of the Covenant. So it was a busy time. In normal circumstances, if somebody says, hey, I found a city that appears to be down at the bottom of our bay, everybody wants to hear more about that and Mediterranean civilizations in general that are lost. A Couple of quick examples. The city of Knossos in Minoan Crete, uh, perhaps the oldest discrete civilization known to have existed in Europe. It went missing somewhere, sometime after the one-two punch of an invasion out of a 1500 BCE volcano and was not rediscovered until the very first bit of the 20th century, which is a long time to go dark. Or the much, much better known pornographic graffiti haven of, of Pompeii. It disappeared after the 1-1 one, one punch of the Vesuvius eruption in 79 CE. The, the eruption <laughs> this eruption probably inspired a line of imagery in the book of Revelation. The second angel blew his trumpet and a mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. So this event sure was no secret, uh, but after a generation or two, and almost up to 1600 CE, Pompey's location got lost. And of course, there is Atlantis. Uh, where the, this is the available image of it. Um, Atlantis may have been in the Mediterranean, or more appropriately in the Atlantic, or under Dodgers Stadium, or on the dark side of Alderaan. The only, the only place we know Atlantis existed was in the Dialogues of Plato, as a dingbat but interesting allegory, which some people may have taken too seriously later. Like this guy. Woo! Sorry, Athanasius Kircher. <laughs> Lost Mediterranean civilizations, real ones or fictional ones, carry plenty of romance. But the one that I'm here to talk about tonight, the lost city of Heraklion slash Tonus, is maybe less like a vanished metropolis and a little bit more like what people of the year 2400 are going to find when they dig up the MacArthur Maze from the bottom of the Alta California Sea. <laughs> Give it time, it'll come. 
I don't describe Heraklion this way to diminish it, but to frame it as a port of call and a harbor complex standing on the islands and sandbars of a wetland. Think very vaguely of Treasure Island and Angel Island, plus Alcatraz and the Dumbarton Bridge and some land filly spans of the Embarcadero Piers. For hundreds of years, this harbor complex at the mouth of the Nile uh, was the public face of Egyptian commerce with the rest of the known world. 300 years before Alexandria was founded, this was the flag Egypt hung out to the Mediterranean. So, smash cut to this amazing guy. After that 60-year lull following 1933, enter Frank Godido, employed internationally as a government mathematician slash economist until his early 40s, he decided to jump into a second career in undersea archaeology. It's a very easy transition to make career-wise. I am always getting the impression from Godito of one part Jacques Cousteau, one part Buckminster Fuller, one part Tony Robbins. <laughs> he's, he's a big self-promoter, but in a way hard not to admire. Springing into action with a grinding half decade of methodical seafloor scanning, funded, funded by who else? Lichtensteinian tool-making magnates the Hilties. Gadido mapped 110 square kilometers of the seabed in Abakir Bay before ever digging up a single thing. There's a lot of silt out there. He made maps, that is certainly true. And by 1996, uh, Gadido could be methodical since there were relatively few Nazis to compete with over interpretations of world history. And I wish that were still so. Sorry. <laughs> so let's run down what this whole thing's about archaeologically. The Nile, flowing north, of course, spreads into its famous delta in the final approach to the Mediterranean. Overlaying here, I will show where in ancient times the main splits of the river progressed through the delta. Now in 331 BCE, Alexander the Great founded his famous coastal city of Alexandria at the extreme west of the delta. But at that time, there was already a thriving port right next door on the Canopic branch of the Nile at Abu, Kirbe, at Abu Kir Bay, 30 kilometers east of Alexandria. The city was Heraklion, which had been doing well for itself for at least 300 years. And I brought my own cat toy. Um, I don't even know why I need to do this, because I already put a red box there. But um, I've got to use the thing since I brought it. Um, to zoom in on that spot, we'll see here uh, in, uh, in this picture <laughs> the results from all of the uh, bay seafloor scanning that was done. And uh, it shows in tan colors where uh, Gadito showed that solid or at least mainly above sea level land used to be. And the next box I'll zoom in onto is the one that contains this schematic diagram of what the Heraklion city complex used to look like. So uh, of important note to this group tonight is that where you see the blue peppering, um, like all of, no, all of that stuff, those are where anchors were found. And where you have anchors, you have uh, some of which were also found in full shippy form too, not just the anchor. Uh, these are the larger blue diamonds that you see splashed around. So a good 66 ships have been turned up from around this site. Most of them uh, were scuttled deliberately back in the day. This is a much older map of the bay before any of this work had been done to excavate, um, and it shows where scholars expected to find Heraklion uh, back on land. And this is probably why I really brought the pointer. They thought it would be there and that it would be two towns called Heraklion and Tonus, um, not out in the middle of the sea, but on land, of course, uh, which they thought were, uh, were two cities sort of that lived cheek by jowl in the same sense as Minneapolis and St. Paul or Buda and Pesht, twin cities. Uh, but we now know that Heraklion and Tonus were just the same place, uh, whether under Egyptian versus Greek naming. So 
Nobody could seem to find this place, though. Uh, but we knew Heraklion should be someplace, because it was mentioned a good three, four uh, times in important ancient sources. First of those is the father of history and chatty Cathy, <laughs> Mr. Herodotus, who never minded passing on false oddities if they interested him. And God bless him for that. So here he is in a statue. And here he is as a character in Assassin's Creed. Um, <laughs> which tells you that Herodotus was important enough to be both a statue and a character in Assassin's Creed. <laughs> Herodotus wrote in the middle 400s BCE and is the man who gave us the genuinely hard-hitting, journalistic, totally real, and unrumored story of what was once called the Battle of Thermopylae and is now better known as this thing. But Herodotus gave us a lot else along the way in his wonderful, weird book, like that griffins and cyclopses are real, let alone uh, these ants he talked about in Persia, big as foxes, uh, that dig up gold dust. So when you hear something from Herodotus, you verify it. But he said there was a city on the canopic outlet of the Nile where not only did the demigod Heracles himself once alight, giving the city its name, and here's Heracles for you in super cool mode. Um, showing you how to dress when you need to fight a lion. <laughs> Herodotus tells us that this city, named after Heracles, figures in the Trojan War a little bit. Uh, when Paris made off with Helen of Troy, who was really from Sparta, just ran to Troy, never mind that. Uh, these lovers on the lamb were blown by a storm into Heraklion, where they were stuck for a night. They made a sacrifice in the Temple of Heracles before going on to Asia Minor to start the Iliad. So that's what Herodotus said. But the takeaway is that there's a port city on the Nile named after and with a temple to Heracles. Let me point out that, boom, the Temple of Heracles is that, you know, big thing in the middle there. I can never punch the right button. So to clean up real quickly, there were other ancient sources about the city. These would include Strabo, whose geography, I will tell you, is ungodly long. <laughs> and Diodorus Siculus, whose Bibliotheca Historica was also less interesting than Herodotus. <laughs> Returning to our contemporary hero, Frank Gaudio, or Frank Gaudio, uh, years of scanning the seafloor led to years of excavations, turning up all of the incredible you know, masonry and statues and artifacts that you would expect from this kind of thing, including but hardly limited to boring pottery and hundreds of interesting anchors and 66 ships. This incredible statue they're dragging down the street in Alexandria. These days, the lost city of Heraklion is still pretty far from what you would call famous. But I did bump into the fact that it now is the name of an annual EDM festival in Egypt. Sp sponsored by Heineken. I have not been able to verify if this festival is organized by the fire festival guy. But the potential for disaster seems obvious. The big question is, what the hell happened? We have this buzzing metropolis of ports, temples, custom houses, which conducted the business of the Nile Valley with the world for a 1,000 years, vanished. It did lose some prominence over time to Alexandria, but the real story is in a phrase that will have a chilling ring to Bay Area ears, and that is soil liquefaction. Interesting. The, the word Nazis or the word soil liquefaction get worse. <laughs> See, if you have water bearing soils or if you have landfill or slippy clay and you set a very heavy structure on it, um, <laughs> then it only takes so much tectonically to send the thing underwater. There is some evidence that stragglers were on a couple of islands in Heraklion at the time Islam came to Egypt in the 600s CE. 
But it was around then that the city's name passed out of history and all memory of its location went dark. People forgot where it had been. No word of a specific catastrophe. And this is more a slow tectonic story than a climate change story, but it was mysteriously forgotten, at least until 1933 when Captain Cull saw it, and then it was forgotten again until 96 when Gaudio and his team began to discover the city anew. So let us raise our glasses to him, uh, to their discovering spirit and his team, and to the hope that someday someone will also dredge up from the bottom of the sea all these interesting spots where we live and work today. <laughs>